morning. Uh, congratulations on making it all the way almost to the end of this. Uh, I, I had some colleagues who took this course last year, and I know it's pretty intense, but I think it's a very good source of, uh, <laughs> a, lot of uh, a lot of good information. Um, so I'm Cyrus Harrison. I'm from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, I'm a computer scientist and a group leader there. And primarily, I focus on VISIT. I'm the architect of VISIT, the open source visualization tool. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about the tool. And I'll be around for the hands-ons for, for you know, answering different, some, a lot of these different questions. I've already had some great questions. I sent out a link last night um, with some more material, including my slides. Um, so if you have that link, um, then, then you, can, you can see where everything that I'm doing is coming from. If you don't have that link, it's pretty easy to get to. If you go to visitusers.org, that's our community wiki site, and you search for tutorial, you should land right there. So the plan is to just give you kind of a brief spiel about Visit, um, a little bit of introduction to, and background on the project, give you a guided tour, so 20 minutes guided tour, which is, you know, you can't do everything in 20 minutes, obviously. Um, but I'm going to kind of speed through a lot of different features and just kind of give you a whirlwind of different, different features from Visit. And then after that, I am going to slow down a little bit and I'm, we're going to do a hands-on sort of pseudo hands-on in the middle of my talk um, using a blood flow simulation. So here's more links, you know, in case you st still, still haven't landed where, where you need to land for the, um, for the tutorial. Um, you should have probably been able to download the example data sets before, but if not, this might be a good time to do it. Um, especially the aneurysm one, it's, you know, it's, I think it's, it's a couple hundred megabytes, so it might take a little bit of time. And my email, cyrush at lnl.gov, feel free to ping me on anything. And talking about the aneurysm data, this is, um, this is where we got it from. So some folks um, that we work with at Swiss, Swiss National Supercomputing Center provide this data for us. It's a, it's a really great data set. You know, we, we've been criticized in years past for having toys, and we were able to put some effort into getting this nice aneurysm um, blood flow data set and spent some work getting it small enough. You know, a couple hundred megabytes isn't that small, <laughs> but getting it small enough to where we can use it in classes like this. So thanks to, the, thanks to them. It was uh, created using a finite element solver called LIFE-E. I think this particular data set is one of many that emerged from the European, European HPC community where they had some challenges on you know, doing this nice medical simulation. So a few years ago, a bunch of these data sets emerged, and we were able to get our hands on one of them. OK. So visitusers.org, is everyone able to get there, assuming the internet works? All right. So I'm going to go ahead and go into a really quick introduction about the VISIT project. So what is VISIT? So Joe gave you some really good context on you know, the set of tools that we use for visualization and HPC visualization in, in particular. VISIT is one of those tools. It's an open source tool. It has a BSD style license. And it's used for you know, production visualization of large physics-based simulations, primarily mesh-based simulations. And it provides you an infrastructure to work on your laptop, all the way up to very, very, very large supercomputers. And it's, you know, it's something that's used not just for heroic, you know, the largest simulation on the largest computer in the world. It's something that's used daily by domain scientists in their work. So and that's, that's, that's been a key part of the success of the tool for quite a while. So Joe covered these, so I'm going to go very quickly through this. But you know, Visit supports the wide variety of things that you need to do with a visualization tool. Um, so, of course, you need to be able to explore your data. You need to be able to get in, slice and dice, ask questions about it. So data exploration is, is probably the most one of the most important and the, and the first things you do with a visualization tool. We also have ways of doing quantitative analysis. So some, sometimes those curves are the most important thing you will ex extract out of your simulation. So we have ways of doing querying and getting curves out. Visual debugging, Joe showed you a very powerful <laughs> example of that where the uh, <laughs> the, the rotor or the part of the propeller just disappeared in the middle of the simulation. That might not have been obvious to you if, if you didn't pull up your data and look at it, right? So um, visual debugging is a really, really powerful feature for people who are developing simulation codes, especially, and also users if they have mesh tangles or stuff like that. Sometimes the context you get from visualization just helps you get right to the issue. Um, we also do comparative analysis, so this would be Something like a eyeball norm, where you have A and B, and you look at them, and you say, oh, OK, they look good. But um, we also have ways to map in parallel meshes onto other meshes. So you can do more quantitative things, like subtract fields across meshes. And then finally, presentation graphics. 
Presentation graphics are great. That's that's you know we, we have to have these movies for our PowerPoint slides, um, or Beamer slides or whatever. I don't want to be <coughs> only include uh, Microsoft products, but um, but yeah. So so I, I, the story here is that you don't just use Visit for making movies. You use it really to get into your data and give you good context about your data. Here's an example of uh, some of the plots that we have in Visit and some of the capabilities. Again, Joe gave you some really good context on this, especially things like glyphs. Um, so vector tensor glyphs for v v visualizing um, fields. Um, streamlines is another way of visualizing fields. We have a very sophisticated parallel streamline integrating in integral curve infrastructure that we use to do streamlines and path lines. Uh, pseudo color plots, which are the bread and butter of visualization. You, you apply false cover to color to help you understand the pieces of your, your, the range of, of things in your simulation data in the field. And volume rendering. So again, Joe gave you a good example of this. You're kind of doing an x-ray, but with fun false color applied to it as a transfer function. We have some, you know, we have some special things uh, for molecular visualization. Again, this isn't the heavy focus of Visit, but we do have some features there, and we have also have some sort of info vis things like parallel coordinates. But those are usually meant to kind of help you help you down select other data that you're doing with. So it's so the focus isn't to be the best line plotter or the best infographics tool out there, um, but we have s some good features that help you get into your data. So Joe mentioned this as well. You, you know, these are Visit and Pairview are both um, distributed parallel tools, and they use MPI for this distributed memory parallelism. So this this is the story you've heard. So you want the picture here on your left, which is you know a beautiful rendering of my full, full big simulation, but the way we're actually process, processing things really looks like what, what's on the right. We have a bunch of subdomains. We have ways of communicating ghosts between them, so we can make sure we do things right on the boundaries. Um, so MPI has been, you know, what we've been scaling on for the last 15 years, and now, obviously, the, the architectures are changing, so we're looking at doing threading and also doing, you know, mini core support. And part of that, part of that answer to that is VTKM, which Joe mentioned before. Both Visit and Paraview are built on VTK, which is a lower level toolkit. It doesn't, in, doesn't involve distributed memory parallelism. Um, but VTKM is hopefully going to give us that on-node performance with GPUs or OpenMP or what have you. So Visit. Uh, I'm from Lawrence Livermore. That's where Visit was born. Visit was born about 15 years ago. Um, it really evolved from a need from our uh, multi-physics simulation codes that were being developed at the advanced scientific, in the advanced scientific computing program called the Initiative at the time, but became a program and became successful. And we are embedded by mainly people doing hydrodynamics simulations and things like that. We're kind of down the hall from them. So this tool grew out of a collaboration with them working on their data. Uh, after we had success with working with, with um, those folks, the project began to grow. We have DOD customers, uh, people at, at universities. So we started to move to an open source model. And we're fully open source now, um, developed our, our repos hosted at Lawrence Berkeley Lab at their NERSC Computing Center. Um, so that happened about 2008. And now we have a bunch of different developers sprinkled around the country and a couple sprinkled around the world who, who help us with Visit. So it's, it's, a, it's a large code. You know, it's a, about 1.3 million lines of code. It's a, it's a hefty, hefty beast. And um, it's, it's, it's still growing and it's still being used very heavily. So. What, what have we been doing lately? I guess this is our what have we been doing lately slide. Um, I mentioned VTKM as uh, you know, this is going to be the path forward for, for dealing with parallelism at the node level for mini core. One of the things that we've been doing pretty interestingly lately is we've been looking at sort of the predecessor to one of the predecessors to VTKM. VTKM is a conglomerate of, it's a new project. It just started recently, but it's a conglomerate, kind of a com combining of three research efforts that started about five or six years ago in the Department of Energy for doing mini core visualization. Uh, one of those efforts is called EVIL out of Oak Ridge. And we've been working on coupling simulations to EVIL in, you know, in core, so in situ, in order to get very quick renders and very, uh, basically make it very easy to do things without having to go to disk. So that's one of the cool things that we've been working on. Another thing that we, another collaboration we have recently built is with um, University of San Diego, well, the Supercomputing Center at University of San Diego, 
And um, they have a tool called Seedme that they've been building, which is a platform that allows you to pub publish your visualization results um, and kind of share it with collaborators. And this is, this is a way, this is actually a way you can get kind of solve the movie encoding uh, problem because they've solved it for you as long as you can publish your things to their platform. They'll encode it for you for your iPhone, encode it for you for your iPad, you know, do all the sort of like a YouTube-esque thing, right, for, uh, for scientific visualization. You can also publish other assets there. So in our Python interface, we actually have built-in support for that. And one other thing, uh, so we added support for, for for basically rendering high order elements that, that use the MFIM library. MFIM is a high order element toolbox that's developed at Livermore as well, and it's important to some of our code development efforts there. So that's, that's, that's one of the neater things that we've done over the last year or so, these things. So Visit has to scale big. It has to work on supercomputers. It has to work on your laptop. How do we do that? Um, we use a client server architecture. This is similar to what Paraview does as well. Um, you can sort of run the GUI pieces on your laptop. And you can have the parallel, parallel stuff happen on a remote server. And instead of streaming all that data back, you just stream those images that you rendered or those numbers that, you know, that those summarization numbers and things like that. Um, so on, on the client side, we have the viewer, which coordinates everything. And then there's all these different other clients, like the, the GUI or the command line interface. That's what the CLI stands for. It's a Python-based interface that allow you to drive and set up your visualizations. And on the server side, that's where we do the MPI, and we use Dataflow networks in order to execute you know, your complex visualization pipelines. So how do we do parallel rendering? That's a very important thing to do for a uh, visualization tool. Um, so we have this scalable rendering mode that is smart. If your data is small enough, actually, it will send it back to your laptop and use your graphics card. But if it gets to a, over a threshold which you can select, we start rendering in parallel on, on you know, the, the engine, the remote resource. And you know, we do that in software. We can do that in hardware. Typically, we do that in software. But there's going to be some things coming out of um, sort of the hardware vendors for OpenGL support that's going to make it easier to use hardware. Um, but you know, the world is basically we have each each one of the processors have their subset of the data, and we have to be able to glue them back together. So we have to be able to do parallel compositing. And this is just for surface rendering, standard rendering. Um, we have a lot of parallel algorithms, volume rendering, ray casting, sending rays through your whole data set. All those things have to be done in a distributed domain parallel way. And that's, that's what, you know, Visit has a collection of all those things. So Visit's a tool, but we also talk about it sort of as a platform. Uh, Joe mentioned these, these tools are, are, are extensible through plugin infrastructure. So, you know, write your own database reader, write your own plots if you would like to. It's, it's sort of an endeavor to do that, but you can, you can do that. Um, we, we heavily rely on uh, Python for scripting. So we have, you know, basically it, it, anything you can do in the GUI, you can also do in Python. And if you're doing batch processing or anything like that, you usually want to have a reproducible workflow. And the best way to do that is to drop to Python. And I'll show you some of that in a bit. We also have an in-situ visualization library called LibSim, which, again, allows you to couple your data to, couple data from your simulation directly to visit without having to write to files. Um, it's, so Visit's sort of a heavyweight thing, so that's kind of scary for some people to do. So we're working on kind of putting Visit on a diet so you can use limited subsets of it in this context. And a another thing to think about, you know, it's, it's a production tool, but it has this really great distributed memory parallel visualization infrastructure. And researchers are increasingly use that, using that because it's a lot of code to write and it's complicated. Researchers are using that in order to do their research for new visualization algorithms. So we're, we're involved in a lot of different research collaborations, just a few here. Um, but more and more people are, are, are using Visit or even tools like Paraview to do their research and then also using that as a vehicle in order to get their research out into the hands of people who would actually use it. So, so that's one of the things we pride ourselves on. All right, so Visit, what's the big deal? Um, so we, ha we set everything up so it works at sale. It's, it's a product. You know, we, we have a support team and things like that. You know, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it grew out of this model of, our model of success was helping our physicists that we were embedded with. And while we can't help everybody in the world, you know, instantaneously, we are very open to helping people with their problems on our mailing list and et cetera. Um, it gives you different features for different types of people. If you're just uh, writing a simulation code and you need, to, you need help debugging that, that's great. If you want to make movies or make presentations, that's another, another set of things you can do. 
And it's also not just for visualization experts like myself, but it's for domain scientists. They can, they can pick up and use the tool. All right. So uh, a couple links here. I already talked to you about visitusers.org. Um, if you search for LLNL visit, you will find visit visits website at, um, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. If you just search for visit, you're probably going to get you know, whatever Google thinks what vacation you want to go on to instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of uh, LLNL visit. So, um, so, so prefix that with uh, LLNL, that's the way to get there. But it's also pretty easy to remember LLNL.gov slash visit. All right, so I am going to switch gears here real quick and start to, do, start to drive the tool. Um, and again, this is going to be kind of a quick overview. Yeah, quick overview of the tool. Yeah, sure. Sure. Can you discuss the difficulties of implementing Lipsim into your code? Yes, it is. It, 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 it's, it's difficult. <laughs> um, so both, both Lipsim and um, Catalyst, which is Paraview's offering, they, they, invo they involve quite a bit of work in order to try to understand. And it's, it's, these things are really the same, same type of story as it's very difficult to write file formats out. Um, for getting my data into. What it is is, um, you know, you have to get your data into a more general model so we can visualize it. We have to know what your mesh looks like. You know, literally, we have to understand that. So most of the hard work that goes into those things is sort of uh, an impedance mismatch between how you have your data in your code and how it, how it needs to be to be visualized. Um, so we are working very hard right now that, that thing I talked about with VTKM and coupling, we're working very hard right now to make it much, much easier to couple your simulation code. Um, we have a new, a new uh, kind of development effort called Conduit that allows you to describe data in core, much more, much, you do zero copy much, much, much easier. So, you know, you're not going to be able to come back next year, but <laughs> next year maybe, maybe, maybe I'll have a, 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 better, a, a better answer for that question. Um, it's very difficult. It's, it's a big software engineering challenge in order to get your data from, from something that you, you, know, you understand completely to something that we can understand and digest. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, this relates more to the system architecture or whether you can work, whether you have means to work around it. Do you have any, any built-in client server <clears throat> for remote rendering, because my experience is at least from, from indirect experience from my colleagues' experience is that compute centers haven't really figured out remote rendering yet, at least many. So, so yeah, we have built in. Yes, we do have built in. Um, so that's why we do software rendering. So um, I can show you. I can show you some examples of what it looks like to be using the using their 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 resources with uh, a client on your desktop. But the rendering happens on the on the server. Yes, and it's, it's, it's you get an image and you get an image back. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah certainly. So all right, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start driving now because I don't want to take up too much time. Um, and again, I'm going to give you a, sort of a whirlwind tour of visit, and then we're going to try to slow down a little bit for a hands-on. So this is, this is what you see when you open up Visit. So we talked about some of the components. This is the viewer. So this is sort of what's in charge of it all and what draws, draws things. This guy over here is the GUI, which allows you to set things up. So there are five basic concepts um, that I like to tell people help you understand Visit. You know, and and it's, it's wide feature set. So the first is a database. So a database is what you know how you get data into visit so that could be a file format it could be libsim it could be an in situ thing um, but the context of sort of how you expose your data to visit we call that a database um, the second one is a plot a plot is what allows you to view data so pseudo color plot volume plot those are examples there's other things like histogram plots for example so so databases plots those are the first two of the five the next is, um, is operators. So operators allow you to do transformations on your data, typically topological transformations on your data, like thresholding, selecting subsets of things. The fourth one is expressions. So expressions are a way that you can, it's sort of, we have a domain specific language, it's a very simple, simple beast that allows you to take fields that already exist on your mesh and compose them with a set of simple operators in order to make new fields. So, what's, so that's a lot of words. What's a good example of that? You have a mesh. Um, you have density on it. Uh, Visit has a, has a little operator that will allow you, or sorry, a little expression that will allow you to calculate the volume per cell. 
you can take that volume, you can multiply it by your density, you can effectively get your mass per cell. So, so that's an example of creating a derived quantity with the expression interface. The fifth is queries. Queries are, are something that allow you to ask questions like what's the total sum of this? Um, you know, so doing integrals and things like that. I'm going to show you examples of all five of these five of these guys. So the first thing that we're going to encounter is a database. So again, that's how we get data in. And I'm going to be working with example data here. We have a, we have a, a file called example.silo. Silo is an I/O library written at, written at Lawrence Livermore that we use heavily with our codes. Um, Example.silo is, is sort of some toy data, some toy tutorial data that we like to spin things around with. So first thing, I opened example.silo, and you see absolutely nothing on your screen except for example.silo up there. And uh, some people give up. <laughs> um, so so we, uh, we, we kind of, this, but this is by design. Uh, usually we, um, if for a small data set, it doesn't really matter. But usually if you're working with bigger data sets, we want you to tell us what you want to do before we do it. We don't want to try to read your mind. So, um, so that file's open, but we need to tell you what to do with it. So here is our, basically, this whole thing here is called a plot list, and it sort of shows you your visualization pipelines. This add here allows you to add the different types of plots. And this, this plot list is aware of the types of fields that are in your data. So a pseudo color plot looks at scalar fields. There's other things like a vector plot. I know I have something called grad, a gradient, in my, in, in my data set. So a vector plot will be able to operate on that. For now, we'll just take a pseudo color plot of uh, you know, a nominal variable called temperature. So I can spin it around, different ways of interacting with it. Um, if, I expand my, if I expand my plot list here, uh, this is sort of how I get into my option, my set of pipelines for my options here, right? So um, pseudo color plot, I can do things like change the color map, which you've noticed if you're running default settings, I've already done. Um, I can set limits explicitly, things like that. So um, the pseudo color plot just shows you your field, you know, but it's on the topology. If you wanted to actually see the mesh topology better, you should be able to, you should use a mesh plot. So it's a separate plot. Um, in this case, there's actually several different types of meshes in this data set, but I'm going to plot the first one called mesh, and that gives me access to um, access to this, this this you know basically showing me the elements of my set with a, uh, a set of line drawings. All right. So um, I, I'm spinning around here. So that's the type of navigation that you would expect. There's also other options I would like to show you about, including zooming, picking different elements and lineouts. But to do that, first, I'm going to show you your first operator. So again, operators transform your data. So we're going to do a slice, which is, this, which is one of the simplest things you can do. So if I go to uh, this, this here allows me to add an operator. And they're categorized. The categorization is probably intuitive to, it's supposed to be intuitive, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, you never figure out think something that's intuitive for everyone, right? So you have to poke around a little bit. Slicing's pretty intuitive. It's under the slicing category, so that's good. Um, I add the slice, and actually I'm going to delete the mesh plot for now. I add the slice, and I draw, and now I actually am, I have a 2D data set that I'm left with. If you look under the options for the slice, you'll see that um, we could actually so by default, it projects it to 2D, but we can uncheck that, and we can actually keep it back in the, um, in the context of, ooh, what, yeah, here it is. I just had it perfectly in the context of the 3D of which it came in. And so you know, I can change axes, and, and et cetera. For now, I'm actually going to keep it in 2D, because that, that allows me to do line outs and stuff a little bit easier. So I have some data. Um, I'd like to kind of inspect it a little bit more. I can do zone and node picks. So there's, you know, terminology for finite element stuff is heavily overloaded. We're kind of influenced by the hydrodynamics community, so we call things zones and nodes as opposed to cells and vertices or points or elements. Uh, so y you might hear me use all of those things today, but um, so so whenever you're talking about things that live on the live on the vertices or the cell or, or the cells or whatever, um, in, in visits interface everywhere, we try to call those the things that are element centered or, or cell centered or node centered or zone centered. We try to call those zone. Sorry. And things that are on the points, we try to call those node. So let's clear that up. So if I do a zone pick, I get a whole bunch of information about you know, 
which basically a whole bunch of debugging information about you know my zone. What's its ID that the SIM code told me it was? Um, what nodes are attached to that zone? In in this case, I did a pick on a nodal variable, so it shows me every node's values. So this is very good diagnostic debugging information. You can also do the similar thing for for nodes. Um, this little guy right here is the line out up a line out. Um, uh, basically a line out interactor. So if I click on that and then I click and drag, I'll get a line. It's hard to do without a mouse. And when I do that, it's, you know, does a sampling across where I did that line. So this is another good diagnostic thing you can do. Once, yep. once you do that, like pretend that's your data and you want to put experimental data on top of it, can you do that or is that just a plot and you can't add any? So you could add another curve. I mean, so if you, you can, there's a curve plot in Visit and if your experimental data is like ASCII text file or something like, like that. File, yeah. That so, there, so there's different ways to get it in there, yes. And then you could, um, yeah. So you, you could do a curve plot with that data. Um, usually we just deal with column, basically x, y columns is the easiest way to get it in, the least ambiguous. But, um, but a script can get you there pretty quick. Yeah. So it's possible to export the data based on this one? Yes, it is. So um, the, you can do that. So visit when you save a window, you're sort of, there's, there's a couple things. You can export a data set, which, is, which sort of can export all the volumetric information and stuff. But you can also save a window. In this case, you can save the curve that's being displayed in the window to an ASCII file. I, I, yeah, I can show that real quick. So if I go to File, there's Set Save options here. And this is where you would normally go to set your you know, kind of resolution and things for what you're rendering out. But if I select Curve, and I hit Save, now I have to, one, thing, one caveat, I have to make sure that that window number two is the one that's active, because that's the one that the line out exists in. If I, if I, set, if I do this, I save. Um, I got this little thing here that told me that visit save 0000.curve, and that's an ASCII text file, um, which probably lives in my home directory. Let's be brave. Yeah, so here's the ASCII file that came out. <laughs> yes? This, this file, how does it get to that data? Does it do a like, fourth order interpolation from the cell value? So no, it doesn't do fourth order. So it's. Um, there's a couple different options. We should talk about that later. There's a couple different options. Um, it's, it's basically, it can do it whether it intersects things or it can actually do it sample base and it would be doing a bilinear interpolation for sample base. Okay, I'm gonna speed up. Yeah. How do you get rid of the bees and stuff? Okay, this is good. Um, so it's just another instance of plot options here. So when I expand this guy and I go to curve, I have a set of things I can do just like with the pseudo color plot. So all the stuff you think is ugly, legends, labels, I can turn off those A and B. Um, I can actually turn off some of the other stuff as well under controls annotation. And if you want to do a line, can you, how do you specify that like IJK instead of using the pick or do you have to use the pick? Through the query interface, you can say I would like coordinate X, Y this, coordinate X, Y that, and you can do that it. Later yeah, okay, all right. So let me look here. We'll have to scale things a little bit here. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to couple just quickly show you a couple more plots. So volume plot. Let me uh, shrink this guy down because I'm going to do ray tracing. So volume plot again. You're kind of sending sending X-rays through, or you know, think about it as an analog to an X-ray, and where you have a, a transfer function that allows you to select which parts of your, you know, kind of the opacity of the parts of your data as you go through it, so you can select different pieces of the puzzle. And when I do this and hit apply, it's gonna, this, I'm using the software volume renderer, so it takes a little bit of time here, but it gives you very, very nice pictures. So I can, um, I can you know, dial that transfer function in and to pick out things as it comes in through the data set. All right, so uh, since we're running a little bit behind, I'm not gonna go through a laundry list of plots. I wanna get to, we've already saw some operators, I wanna get to expressions. So again, expressions allow you to derive quantities. The way you get there is under the controls menu, there is an expressions window. And this is sort of the playground for defining these things. And I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is there's a, we already saw temperature. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a gradient of that temperature and define a new vector field that has that. So I'll call it temp grad. 
And again, there's a, there's a little sort of domain specific language that allows you to do this stuff. And this actually output will be a vector, so I need to specify that. If I do this, now when I come down, if I went to the vector plot, I will see my new thing, temp grad here, is plottable. But you know, we can also compose expressions of other expressions. So if I wanted to get the magnitude of that, I can say magnitude of temp grad. And now I'll have a scalar field that I can plot that gives me that magnitude value. So you know, the difference here is that Let's see where's temp grad? Yeah, temp grad magnitude. Difference here is that you know visits calculating this stuff for you, kind of on the fly. It wasn't in your database. Is that are those all under insert functions or? Yeah, yeah. there's a, there's some guessing and there's some help. <laughs> um, so uh, so there's some there's some secret ones, but uh, we try to have most of them in an insert function. So queries, I also want to show you queries real quick. So. Again, queries are a way allow you to ask, ask and answer questions. So we have controls query. We have a set of queries here. Um, they're, they're also categorized. Um, but I'm going to just show you a very specific example here, the, the max query. So if I'm plotting a vector, plotting, plotting some scalar, assuming that plot's active here, when I click query max, it will tell me, hey, the maximum value of your temperature is this, and here's where it lives on your mesh. Um, so there's an there's, there's option here that's a little confusing for some folks. It's original data and actual data. So often people really quickly want to compare what they have right out of their file to something they've done, like a threshold or something like that. So if you do original data, that gives you the data as it was out of the file or as it was out of the expression right when it happened. And if I do actual data, um, if I did an operator like an ISO surface or something like that and, and, and got rid of some of my data, um, I would be able to get the values right at the end of the pipeline. All right, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit more, but it's very important. So I'm going to so client server, the the rendering, the kind of re remote rendering stuff. I want to show that in the hands-on and how that works. Um, I think it's 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 more useful to show you our, our Python interface and a little bit about how that works. So. Um, let me, I'm going to only show, well, I'm going to play two examples, but I'm going to only go into one of them. And the, the thing to understand about Visit's Python interface is, um, so anything you can do in the GUI, you can do in the Python interface. And the, the two are connected. So we have a way for you to record what you're doing in the GUI and turn that into a Python script that then you can edit and, and get to. So I'm going to show that first. So if I go to Controls Command, this is the window that allows us to do this recording. It's actually where I'm going to, these are kind of little scratch pads for writing Python scripts. That's where I'm going to run my scripts in a second. But first, I want to show you what it looks like to, to record some Python. So um, in the commands window, there's this record thing. It sort of feels like a macro interface from you know, the 90s or, or whenever those, those were very popular. Um, so when I click record, the, the, our Python interface pops up. And whatever I do in the GUI here now is going to be captured for when I hit stop. So if I add a pseudo color plot, and I'm going to say, all right, I want an ISO surface operator. I want to draw those things. So here's the picture I got. Now, if I hit stop, I get some Python here that tells me, if I were in the Python interface, that's how I could have done those two things. So this is very powerful. You know, I've worked on Visit for nine years. I probably use this almost still. I mean, I don't know the Python interface. It's huge. I, use this almost every day of my life, right? So this is a very, very, very useful, useful thing to learn the Python interface and to turn something you did into something that's re reproducible. Real quick, I want to show you some examples of Python scripts. So um, these, these are linked off of a larger tutorial on that web page that I sent you before. Um, but they give you a flavor of what the Python interface looks like. So in this simple one, we're, we're going to basically Add a plot of a pseudo color, which we've seen over and over again. Add an ISO surface, which you saw me just do. right? And then we're going to loop over a set of ISO values. So this will allow you to kind of sweep a set of ISO values and see an animation of that um, as, as we're doing it. So let me run that guy. I happen to have it set up here, so it should be easy to do. OK, so there's the result. right? And you'll notice. You'll notice that um, this, you know, so you, I'm sweeping over these things. 
commented out here at the bottom of the above, above, bottom of this guy is if you want to save a save an image off, there's a save window command. So this is how people make their make their movies. They usually, especially if they're fly throughs and complicated things like that, you got to set things up with Python. You call save window several times. Save window allows you to do things other than just marching through a time slider. Right? I can animate whatever I want to. One other example is um, I want to show, and I like this example because it shows using all of the building blocks in Visit in you know about 30 lines of Python. So that's nice. So um, the first thing I have commented out because I already have it open, but uh, opening a database, right? So a database is one of those building blocks. A plot, which you've seen before, is one of those building blocks. So we're adding pseudo color like we've seen. In this case, we are doing a, a different operator than you've seen before. It's a three slice. Instead of taking one slice, it takes three orthogonal slices. It's a common thing you do in visualization in order to get context. So I'm adding this operator three slice, and I'm telling it I want to do it at specific planes in x, y, and z. I'm doing a query to get the max value, so you know, because I'm curious about that. I, so, so query is one of those building blocks. Expression is one of those building blocks. So in this case, we're seeing sort of exactly what I did for you by hand. I want to create a new, a new expression that gives me the gradient of my field. So I use the expression. I define an expression and use our expression language to do that. And then finally, I add another plot, which is a streamlined plot, um, setting some attributes there. So let me run this one. So here's the plot that we get at the end of that. All right. So that's as far as I want to go for the uh, for the um, the tour of visit. So uh, so we'll dive into this hands-on on, on um, this aneurysm simulation. And on the wiki page is broken into three parts. I'm probably going to only get through one and a half of those parts realistically. Um, but let me just yeah. So it's linked off the page I sent you. This is what it looks like here. Uh, we're going to be doing the initial data set exploration and also this visualizing the velocity vector field. Um, so if, if I go too fast, I'm under time pressure, I might. Uh, these things are detailed pretty well, um, kind of very prescriptively on the wiki. You know, Twiddle this knob, set this thing to x, y, z. So you can go through it yourself after the fact. But this is largely what we're going to be following here. All right. And you've seen some of the concepts already through the, through this, th through the tutorial, so I might, might speed up a little bit. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this data set, which our example data set, which is, uh, again, from the simulation of an aneurysm. And these, the file I'm going to open is called aneurysm.visit, which is grouped, basically groups all 200 time steps of this data set together. And first, we'll take a look at the mesh. So I'll do a mesh plot. Let's see this guy. What kind of data set is that .visit? So dot .visit is a meta file that groups other files together. This particular data is actually a silo data set. It's written, each one of the time steps is written in silo. And you'll actually, you see this here? It says, it says that, they're, that they're silo data set. OK, so here, here's our, you know, our topology of our for our mesh simulation for the artery. Um, so, okay. what, uh, so what do we have here? What, what type of elements are those? It's, it's audience participation time. They look like triangles, but they they are actually in 3D. So what do you think they are? Tets. tets. They're tets. Actually. Yes. Okay. So we have um, you know so we have this mesh. The uh, mesh topology actually does not change over time in the simulation. So the mesh itself isn't really interesting, but the fields on the mesh are. Um, going in here on the mesh plot, we have a bunch of different options in order to look at things. For example, I can. Um, Basically, right now, it's, it's, it's all those cells, all those tets are opaque. But if I turn that off, I can sort of see into the data set like a wireframe mode. Um, I can also play with the opacity and other, other things like that. I can actually show the internal zones, which there's a lot of them. So you're just going to see a black screen, right? Um, so different ways in order to put, give you context for the computational mesh. I don't want to spend too much time on this, since I told you this doesn't change over time. Let's go ahead and let's look at the. Um, Let's actually look at sorry, some of the fields. So this data set um, was extracted from a simulation. We only got a couple fields out of it because we wanted to make it downloadable. You, know, and you, you might even be mad at me for being a couple hundred megabytes. Sorry. Um, it has pressure, and it has a velocity vector field. Those are the two fields that are in it. So I'm going to go ahead, and we'll just take a look at those. So pseudo color of pressure. 
So here's the pressure field. Again, there's 200 time steps. So before we were looking at data sets that had a single time. So the example.silo had a single time. This is what it looks like if you have a time varying data set. You have this time slider that allows you to give you context for where you are. And I'm just playing through that pressure field here. It's sort of, it's, you know, the, the color bar is instantaneous at each time step right now. Um, so, so things are floating and that's, that's a little jarring. So let's change that to something sensible. So if I, again, if I go into the plot list and I expect expand the pseudo color plot, I can set the limits here. So I'm going to set it to something that I know sort of makes sense, so 500. So I'm clamping it at 500, basically. That way we, ha we have our color bar staying the same throughout the whole time. So now if I play it, you can get a better feel for where the pressure, you know, what's going on with the pressure as it, as it progresses. So, um, so when you think about a, a simulation of an aneurysm, what type of things do you think, you know, what type of signal do you think we should be able to extract from this? I almost let it, I almost let it out of the bag. <laughs> So, uh, so, so what, what does blood do? Does it just continuously throw, flow through all your arteries or, do you, or, or something pumping it? Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> all right, tough crowd. Um, okay, so, um, so we would think that if we were simulating a, um, if we were doing a, you know, a CFD simulation of an artery that we would be driving it with some sort of heartbeat that makes sense, right? So let's go ahead and I want to use our query interface to extract the maximum pressure for all these 200 time steps and see what we see. So we saw an example of a query before where I said, give me the max for this particular time step. We're going to use it in a little bit of a different way. We're going to do it all these time steps. Before I do that, I'm going to go into controls and there's something called query over time options. And you have different, you have basically when you're doing this, you're going to make a curve over time and you, you want to select your x-axis to be something that makes sense. So in this case, it defaults to cycle, which in this data set is always zero, so you'd get a nice vertical line and you'd be confused. Uh, we're going to set it to time, because all of these actually have their time, basically uh, some time in you know, fractions of a second associated with them. And I'm going to set that. That way, when we do this query, we'll get something that makes a little bit more sense. So I'm going to go to Controls Query again. And I'm going to go to max, which is what we did before. And what I'm going to do differently here is I'm going to say check do time query. So this is going to say instead of doing it for a particular time, it's going to do it over that whole time slider. And um, you could, you know, you could stride through your data set. You could do all these things, but I'm just going to say go for it. Let's let's do it over all 200 time steps. So it's feverishly reading all those time steps right now and feverishly taking a max of every one of them. Uh oh, I did it wrong. <laughs> My horizontal line. I didn't get to. Uh, okay. I didn't get my settings set, I guess. Controls, query over time options. Thought I did. Probably didn't hit apply. Either that or real trouble. All right, try again. There we go. All right, it picked an unfortunate color for it. Let me change that real quick. At least for this projector, I can see it, but I doubt you can. Let's make it black. All right, so uh, by taking the maximum of the pressure over all time, we, we get a signal here. And what does it look like we have in the simulation? So we have, so we, so I think I would say we have two heartbeats in the simulation. Um, the actual simulation is much longer than this. I think it has, you know, 20 heartbeats or something like that. All right. Okay. So um, yes. Why are there so many pressure labels there? Um, so it's a style. It's. It's a style of, if you had a whole bunch of different curves on this, you might get confused. So it sort of just drops pressure all over the place. I particularly don't like that style, but that's the default style that we've had. You can turn that off. Yeah. If you're doing like line outs and stuff like that, it's actually very useful because you'll have these things that are line A, B, C, D, E, and you can get, you, the colors maybe not, don't give you as much context as you'd like, especially if you have 10 or 20 of them. Yeah. Where, where did you go to get rid of the pressure? Um, oh, sorry. So if you go here, and the, the, I it created a curve plot. If I go here, I can turn off the labels. It's called the labels under the curve. Plot. Um, let's look at another field. So we looked at the pressure. I told you there's also the velocity. Um, if you have vector fields defined in your file, visit will automatically define a set of, a, a, basically a magnitude expression for you out of convenience. So I didn't have to define a magnitude expression. Visit's going to calculate it for me. 
Um, but I'm looking at the magnitude of the velocity vector field. Um, so this in itself doesn't look all that interesting, except for in the inlets and the outlets, and that makes sense. There's a boundary condition, you know, on the wall of the artery. You don't. Hopefully things aren't going out everywhere. Um, so, um, so in this case, just doing a pseudo color plot isn't too informative, right? We kind of want to dive into it a little bit more. So to do that, we're going to use the isosurface operator and the iso volume operator. So uh, isosurface, I think people are, are familiar with. Basically, you say you have a scalar field, and you'd like to set some value. Say, I, I know 5. I want to find the, all the values, like kind of the surface of, of all the values that are at pressure 5, and it will give you a nice surface out of it. ISO volume um, does that, except you set a top, 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 a top bound and a lower, and a, bleh, an upper bound and, and a lower bound. So I could say I'd like to see all the values in between 10 and 20, and you will get the subvolume out. So you could do things like integrate that subvolume. So that's 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 useful for certain things. Before we actually kind of dive in and start taking these you know high velocity ISO surfaces out, I want to put up another plot just to give us context so we don't lose you know, context of where things are happening in this simulation. So I'm going to create a subset plot, and this is actually sort of like a mesh plot, um, but if you had a multi-domain data, data set, you know, distribute a bunch of processors, this would give you the domain decomposition of it. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to do a subset plot, and I'm going to just make it opaque, or t turn it down so it's not completely opaque, make it transparent so we can see inside of the mesh. Yes? Can you please read the options you picked? So, so yes. Um, so, so I'm, I'm trying to go fast. They're all on. They're all on the wiki page as well. So I, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, for this, I did a. I'll, I'll go through it again. So I did an add subset plot of mesh. And here I double clicked on mesh, or uh, double clicked on the subset plot. I got the subset attributes. I clicked here to change the color, and then I clicked here to change the opacity. Those are the two things that I did. I apologize for going fast. All right. So we have this here. Now this is sort of le letting us see the outline of our mesh. And I want to get back to the task at hand of looking at these regions of high velocity. So I'm going to add a pseudo color plot of our velocity magnitude. And I'm going to add an operator first operator we're going to do is isosurface, which is under sl slicing and isosurface here. Double click on that guy. And by default, isosurface just picks, you know, I want 10 levels throughout the, the range of my data set. I know a little bit more about this data set, so I'm going to set it to specific values. So you can also do a list of specific values. I'm going to set that to 10, 15, and 20. So we'll have three ISO surfaces, one at each of those ISO values. Draw that. So now we have sort of these nested ISO surfaces. You can see them here. Um, and you know, one, one being of you know, low, medium, high. And if I play this, you'll, you'll get an idea of where, where things are moving very fast in the simulation at what points in time. All right. So um, I, I talked about an ISO volume. Yes. yes. When I do the ISO surface, it seems to add that operator to both. Oh yes. Sorry. I, I I was going too fast. Yes. This this thing here. So apply all operators to all plots is a convenience thing that's on by default. You do need to turn that off because otherwise it's going to try to ISO surface the other other mesh. I'm I'm sorry. I skipped that. I'm going to show you the ISO volume. So uh, ISO volume, again, is like an ISO surface. It's actually under selection, because it's not slicing. It's selecting a subvolume called ISO volume. And we're going to look at sort of the same thing. Um, but again, this is, this is a bounding. This is creating a volume bounded by these, these, um, the values. So I'm going to do an ISO volume of velocity magnitude. And recall last time we did 10, 15, 20. Now we're just going to look at everything between 10 and 20. I'll hit apply, dismiss, and draw. And now when we look at our data set, we can see it's not these nested surfaces anymore. It's actually a volume. And we're playing it here. So 
it's, it looks similar. So um, I think you know, in the interest of time, we I'm I'm gonna I want to take some questions, and I don't want I don't want to cut into your break too much. Um, so this is the end of the first section. So we didn't make it through one and a half of the, the section of the tutorial. The second section of the tutorial for this actually goes into looking at the velocity vector field and using glyphs to visualize it. So, um, so you know, an example of basically looking directly at your vector field and then also doing things with streamlines. So I'm gonna. There's a lot of options in this, and, and uh, I, I don't, I, yeah, I don't want to try to rush through it. But um, you know, I can leave it up to you, and I can help you go walk through these steps if you'd like to. It shows you how to use instantaneous streamlines, and shows you how to actually, by the end, sort of animate the path of as if you had vected it through the time step with the, you know, kind of the, the correct integration. So uh, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead, take some questions real quick, and then and get you back to the coffee. Any more questions? Yes. So, so Visit is automatically telling whether you have a time series plot or not? Yes. Yeah, so when you open up, so that's sort of handled by the database, right? If the database exposes multiple time steps, it will pick that up. OK. But all of this would be exactly the same if it was just one snapshot, like the interface is still. Yes. Yeah. The only difference is that um, you know, your time slider is kind of not very useful. So it's just there. You can't do anything with it when you have a single data set. Yeah. 